I love how God begins to move and he begins to wake us up. So often, do you ever feel like you're kind of falling asleep in your faith? You ever have a moment where you felt like, I just, I want more. I want more. We're going to be in Ephesians 2, and it talks about being made alive in Christ. To be made alive, to be woke up in Christ. Because, see, so often, I feel like we, we're really meant to be alive in Christ, but what we feel is like ho-hum in Christ. Sometimes we feel a little bit like we're just uh, barely making it in Christ. We're, we're, we're still struggling, but kind of in Christ. I showed up at church in Christ, and I'm really hoping to walk out of here feeling something. Does that resonate with anybody? Like, do you, do you feel today like, man, I woke up and I was alive for Jesus, and I'm just, I'm going to just set this world on fire. I'm just going to go do everything. Man, you don't always feel like that, do you? Sometimes we wake up and literally think like, <sighs> except you probably don't spit. <laughs> Be warned, first row. You feel like you just woke up and you're like, Jesus, if you got something, send it my way. Get in the car. You ever turn on worship music and you're like, uh, something else. Like, come on, we're going to be honest and have real church, right? Like, sometimes you feel like, I'm not alive in Christ, and I don't know, I'm not sure if I want to be right now. You're like, I'm just in a pity party moment. If Scripture talks about Jesus came and that we, we died with him on the cross so that we could be made alive, doesn't that mean we should be alive in Christ right now? Like, it, like we died with him on the cross. That's already done. It's not like I'm waking up waiting for it to happen. Like, it's already done. You have the ability right now to begin to walk in Christ. But sometimes we kind of get locked up. We're not real sure what that is. How, how do I even get the ball rolling? What, what is going on? So I want to talk a little bit about that today. We're going to be in chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. Let's just read these real quick. It says, And you were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. I'm going to read it again, just so you make sure, right? If you've got a highlighter or a pen, you want to write in your Bible, this is your moment. Get it ready. And you were dead. You see how that was past tense? You were dead in your trespasses and sin in which you formerly walked according to the course of the world. You are either were dead or you're dying in sin. You've either decided that, like, I died to myself, I died to sin, I've set all of that down, and now I can be made alive in Christ, or you say, no, I'm still dying to sin because this is just dragging me down everywhere I go. I have no ability, I can't, I just, uh, I just can't make it. Is that anybody here that feels like you, can you tell the difference of what I'm trying to say? There is a past tense to scripture when it comes to you, the, old, the old you. That's what you were. Now, I'm talking to those of you who know Jesus, who have given your life to Jesus. If you've not done that before, if you don't know of the moment in your life when everything changed for you, I'm probably not talking to you yet. You may literally still be dead in your sin. It takes only Jesus and recognizing the sacrifice that he made and saying, that did it. That did it. It's nothing that you can do. This process is not something that you can go work to obtain, try harder to make, but it's something that you have to believe. It takes a moment of faith to realize what Scripture says about who we are. You see, in Romans 8.1, it says, therefore, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. How many of you are still feeling like the more you drive this line, the more you're condemned in it? The more shame you have about the things that we suffer with and the things that are happening around us and the things that we look at, the things that we eat or the things that we drink and the thing, things that consume us. There are so many things that are sin in our life. There's so many of these things that are coming. How many of you feel shame and condemnation because you're just still stuck in it? You can't get rid of it. But if Romans says that there is no more shame and condemnation, it's because we have left that old self over here and begun to recognize who we are and walk that out. 
I had somebody caught me in between services. I'm not real sure what he was talking about other than the people's names. It's, it's like old Greek mythology kind of a thing. And he says this really cool story about um, how the ship would sail past all the, uh, he said sirens, right? You know, you probably don't, I don't know, if, I'm hoping you track with me on this story, but it's really cool because he was talking about these sirens would sing and the ships would go over to them. And they'd crash and they'd trap them, all that kind of stuff, kill them, whatever. I don't know the full story. Just the point being, the point being is that one guy decided, I'm going to tie myself up to the mast of my ship. I'm going to put wax in the ears of the rowers, and we're just going to have to just go real hard right past this. Right? Do you ever feel like that's you and your sin? Oh, man. It's going to be, it's going to be hard. It's going to be real hard. I got to just, I mm, just got to, somebody, somebody tie me down and don't let me go. We've probably thought about that. Then there's this other guy that decided to sell him. What he did is he, he hired a guy that could play the flute real well. I probably would have picked that instrument. I'd probably gotten like Nick to be like, hey, dude, bring your amp and your guitar, bro. Play me some sweet tunes, you know? Like that would have been something a little different. But what he did is he had him stand on the ship and play the most beautiful song he could, he could imagine. He hired the best guy to come play the best song. And he just fixed his eyes on that. And then whatever they were singing didn't even influence him. That's like us with Jesus. So often we've thought, I've just got to, oh, that sounds so good. Man, I want to go do that. But the Bible says that I don't get to have any fun. <laughs> right? Like, I, like, like, this is what we think. Like, oh, man, I'd really like to go out and party and have a good time. It's like what most, like what you might think. But you're like, Jesus says no. <laughs> and we tend to think like, oh, weekend's coming. I'd really like to go out with my friends. Like, you know, you just think through this process of like what it may be like. But Jesus is like, listen, I am so good. I am so sweet. If you put your eyes on me, you won't even hear the sounds. You won't even hear it. So when I'm talking about coming from, like, setting down all that dead stuff and turning to him, this is what I'm talking about. We keep dragging stuff along that we, we think we need and we think that we want. And we know what it brings. We know that, like, you, you know that, like, going out and drinking with your friends, you know that that's not a good idea. You know that going out, driving out there, Drinking with a bunch of people and then going home is probably a bad idea. You may have been, end up drinking too much and get pulled over and get a ticket. You could wreck, kill somebody. That's a bad idea. Going out to party like that with your friends could be a bad idea. But we sit there and all we want to do is just look at that like, oh, man, I'm going to have to give up that? I don't know if I'm going to give up stuff. When he's sitting there just going, if you'll just look at me, I love what Kelsey was saying. And just imagine Jesus' face right in front of you. Just right in front of you. Give me, I need a dude. Come here. Come here. I, I need you to stand right here. This is what we tend to think. When we think of Jesus and he's like right in front of our face, just stand right here, bro. That's it. All right, stand right there. We think that that's Jesus, right? And we do this. Jesus, you're so good. I love you, Jesus. Oh, so good. But Kelsey said, no, imagine he's right in front of you. And so in our mind we think, yeah, I see Jesus is good. And we might be like, oh, we might be brave enough to get a little closer, but what he really wants is some of this. He wants to be right in your face. He wants you to know how much he loves you, this radical, intense love right in front of your face. And But for some reason, we want to just keep it at a distance like it's safe. He probably didn't feel very safe right here. <laughs> like, but that's Jesus. He wants you just to like... I don't care what it takes. I'm going to run for your face, Jesus. I want you. I'll jump if I have to jump. I'll do whatever it takes, Lord. I will just be quiet. If you want me to be quiet, Lord, I'll be quiet. I'll come fall down and I'll just cry at your feet. Whatever, God, I just need you. I want more of you. I want more of you. You know why, God? Because you're so good. You're so good. I'll put down my dead stuff and I'll run to your face. But when we think of it, like, just set it down and turn. You're like, does that mean we just never see? No, no, sometimes it tries, to ch it tries to get you. But Jesus is so good. If you'll give him a moment, he is so good that nothing else matters. Nothing else matters. Even from the beginning, though, God had a plan because he knew we'd mess it up. He knew we'd mess up. So in verses 4 through 5, it says, But God, being rich in mercy because of his great love which, with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, God loves you so much. You ever heard that God hates you? You ever heard that before? Anybody ever told you, oh, God probably hates you? I'm sure there's people out there who say this kind of thing. I've seen it. I'm going to read the verse again so you just know how God really feels about you. It says in verses, chapter 2, verses 4 through 5, but God, being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, he loved you. 
Even when you're in the midst of chaos, you don't even know who he is. He loves you so much, he's pursuing you. He's chasing you. He'll leave the 99 for you because it's a reckless kind of love for you. It's for you. It's not like us collectively happy, Jesus. It's I don't care who you are, where you're sitting in the room. Jesus loves you so much, even if you're in the midst of your sin and you don't know how else to get rid of it. You don't know what's going on. All you know is you probably need Jesus, so you're here. He's chasing you down, and he wants to tell you he loves you, not condemn you, not throw you away, but just to get right in your face and just speak only love in you. You ever wanted to be prophetic? I hear we, we talk about the prophetic all the time. I'm going to teach you two words to be prophetic in your life. And it comes out of this verse. But God. I was taking a deep breath trying to breathe at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> but God. Listen. You go up to somebody and you just, they say, how's it going? You li Listen, my life has been a wreck. This happened and this happened and this happened. But God says that I'm loved. God says that I am, and then you just start filling the blanks with all of the things that you find in Scripture. You want to find out who you are? Dig in this right here, and he will tell you over and over. You're more than a conqueror. Like, he can empower you to move, and that's who you are, and that's how we begin to speak it. It's that I don't look at this and say, well, this is what I am, but God eventually, or but God's going to do this. But, but we say, this is who I was, but God says this. And so I'm going to walk in that, even if I don't feel like it. Like, my hip has been hurting for a long time. I'm going to tell you, my hip got hurt, and this is, I've probably said this before. The thing was, I finally started to register something, is that when Jeremy and a few others, like David, y'all prayed for me, and I said, I'm going to go run. I, I can't run because my hip starts hurting real bad. Erica knows because I whine about it a lot. That's my wife. <laughs> my hip's been hurting. It's actually getting better. You know why? Because I began to believe what God says, that if he can heal, he's going to do it. And you know what? I'm going to start doing it. Right, I'll run. And I was a little nervous. I get on trail, I'll just start running. And I'm like, oh, it might hurt. But no, God said I could be healed. So I'm going to run thanking him for what he's going to do. I wonder if he's like, you know, you can be healed. So, like, you keep praying for it. Can you take one step of faith that it's going to be healed and not just be like, but God says it will. So I'm just waiting for it to completely go away. I'm just, no, I'm going to start running. And it actually feels pretty good. It's like God's like, yeah, you loosen it up a little bit and start running. Look what's going to happen. You just keep praying and believing. But God says I can be healed. So I'm going to walk in that. Bill Johnson said something beautiful. It says, this is the nature of faith. It looks ahead and lives accordingly. Why do we keep living based off of what's happened and all this stuff, right? It's like we're backing up towards God, right? All this stuff that's been mounted up again, is, and, the, and the enemy wants to remind you of it over and over and over again. And we keep going, but God, it's like we take a faint look over what he says about us, and then we're like, whoa, but that's bad. Can I get some people to turn and just walk in what God says about you? Begin to move in that. It's easy to go evangelize. You go tell them who you used to be and then say, but God, and just tell them how you are now. That's how you witness to coworkers. That's how you raise up your kids. Yeah, I used to be pretty rough. Don't tell them too many stories. They're young, you know, don't. <laughs> My dad loves telling stories, man. I love them. But, man, he probably told them too early. Try to live up to them, you know. He got a little rowdy. But the point being is you just say, but God, and tell them what he did. They can't deny that. They see it in your life. See, when God steps in, everything changes, and we begin to be alive. We now are alive in Christ. I'm not, like, still holding on to my stuff in Christ or still staring at all the stuff that identifies me, but I'm in Christ. Like, no, we walk in Christ. Who he says we are, all of it. Verses 5 through 7 says that he made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the ages to come he might show the surpassing riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. I underlined this. It said, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Man, just highlight that and just take that one scripture right there this week and just let the Lord tell you what he's trying to tell you in that. That could probably preach for longer than a week, three weeks, ten weeks, that he seats us with him in heavenly places in Christ Jesus? And you ever wonder if you have the ability to speak a blessing over somebody? You're seated in the heavenly places. It's difficult to grasp these things, isn't it? 
It's hard to grasp this stuff. But God wants to do something in us. He wants to wake us up, bring us into something new. Life is painful sometimes. How many women have ever given birth in this room? Show of hands. Now, keep your hand up if it was not painful. It's always painful. Bringing life into the world is painful. Bringing life is painful to you. To step into something new for yourself, it's going to hurt. How often did Jesus' disciples read the, uh, sit with Jesus and go, hey, that was a good word, easy. Never. That, was, that wasn't a thing. If you've ever come into church and walked out and said, like, good day, simple, you probably weren't listening. <laughs> the scriptures were meant to challenge us, to push us, to make us alive, which causes something to have to be birthed new in your life. Something has to be different and change. I want to talk about an avocado seed. There's something really cool about how to grow an avocado tree that is like us. And there's some steps I want to talk about. Step one is that you have to remove the seed and clean it. It says you can't have any of the, the avocado on it, so you have to clean it real good. And that's like us. We have to be removed from this comfortable place. If we really want to be fruitful, we have to be removed from a place of comfort and cleaned up and ready. Step two says to locate which is up and which is down. Guys, that's scripture. You got to know which way is up and which way is down. If you're having to run and ask questions of everybody else, like, hey, what do you think scripture says? What do you think scripture says? What do you think scripture says? I'm going to Google it. How about you just get your Bible open and find it? Like, we, could just, we can just read this thing over and over and over until it just comes out of us. But we have to know what's up and what's down. Step number three, you have to pierce the, the seed with four toothpicks. You have to pierce it. So often, we are afraid of letting somebody else pierce us. You need a support. You need somebody who can be a toothpick in your life. And piercing is not easy. Piercing hurts. We are afraid to get pierced. We want to be comforted and coddled. It's true. It's me. I don't like being pierced. I don't like when somebody has a hard word for me or so challenging. That hurts. But we need it. And not just one. It says four toothpicks have to be stuck in there. And then they take a cup of water and they put that seed in it. And the toothpicks are meant to hold that seed at just the right level of water. So it's like just halfway submerged in water, and those toothpicks are meant to hold it there. Just like so many people have come, and they need to speak into your life and pierce you and hold you in the Holy Spirit to be able to nourish you, to hold you. You know why? Because that seed needs to begin to take root, and that seed begins to grow down in that water. And it says don't let any of that root come out of the water. It has to be completely submerged, just like you have to be pierced and allow for your roots to be submerged in the Holy Spirit. Then what happens is really beautiful. A, a green little shoot will come out of the top. And you have to let it grow up about six to seven inches. You know what you do at six to seven inches? See this beautiful plant growing? Think of it in your own life. you got to chop it halfway down. God will come and begin to prune you even in the early stages. While people are holding you in the spirit, just trying to keep you there, speaking hard things. It will come back and he will prune you. Because it's not supposed to be easy. You're not supposed to be coddled into the kingdom. Sometimes it hurts, and it's got to be okay with us. I don't always understand it. I don't understand the process and why, but I just know that it creates growth. And he knows if I can just cut this off, it's going to create more growth. So what will happen is as it grows again, and gets six, seven inches. It says they pull out the toothpicks, and you can bury it in good soil, and it will take root now. The process of that avocado is very much like us. We have to allow for people to speak into our lives. It's going to pierce. It's going to hurt. And that's okay. And we have to be rooted in the spirit. Don't let those roots ever grow out from that spirit. And then when you begin to see some new life growing, the Lord's going to come by and to create new growth. He may have to take some of that off. And you'll think, man, just when I felt like I saw everything beginning to go right in my life, that had to happen again. You ever felt like that? You ever felt like, man, I just got that new job and it got swept away. 
We just got the report. My wife is good and she's not anymore. I just got that next thing and he took it away. Why? Why? Because God may be doing it to create new growth in you. We are so quick to blame the enemy when God can be like, no, no, I'm pruning. Let it grow. Let it grow. Stay strong. Stay rooted. Let those friends stay right there with you. You know why? Not because God's a mean God, because he's a good God and he wants you to grow strong. He can leave you in that cup for a long time and you'll just drown, submerged, and never grow. But you got to release everything you know and think and just let him do his work in your life. You know why? Because he's a good God. And you know what scripture says next? Verse 8 says, for by grace you have been saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it's the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one can boast. I don't care how hard you are trying to correct yourself, to fix yourself, you can't do it. It's a gift of God, and you just release and say, thank you, Jesus. So when we get to this place and we say, I'm going to lay it all down, and I'm going to turn and say, but God, and I'm going to walk every step, and I'm not going to look back. I'm going to say exactly who he says I am. I'm going to keep walking in that. You know our next response? Our next response is to praise and to worship and to enter his courts with thanksgiving, not to just come in wholeheartedly. Oh, that was a good service. Oh, thank you, Lord, for a little bit. I don't want a little bit anymore, church. I want all he's got. I want every bit of it, and it takes some of us to get out of our way and have a little bit of a reckless praise come up out of a church. We're going to sing right now, and I want you to sing with everything you've got, because he's good, because he is good. 